Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Cooper Quinton. I'm with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you today about third-party tracking and corporate surveillance on the web, uh, how it works, and how we're going to stop it. Um, so in case any of you are not familiar with the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, we're a nonprofit that defends civil liberties uh, online. We do this through a combination of impact litigation, activism, and technology work. Uh, we have projects like HTTPS Everywhere, Let's Encrypt, Panopticlick, and Privacy Badger. We also sometimes sue the NSA. Um, <laughs> and sometimes we fly a blimp over their headquarters. I am a staff technologist at EFF, uh, which basically means I'm a programmer. Uh, and I cannot answer your legal questions because I am not a lawyer. So if you have legal questions, go ask your lawyer. Uh, today I'm going to talk about browser tracking, uh, why it's a bigger problem than you might think, and why it matters. I'm going to talk about who's tracking us, how they're doing it, and what we can do to stop it. So what is a third-party tracker? Is, is the location based on the corner? Is that like a joke? Or no, that's just I don't know how to change that in LibreOffice. Okay. Um, so a third-party tracker is a resource that gets loaded from the domain other than the one you intended to visit. So if you go to slashdot.org, for example, it loads resources from DoubleClick from, and from a bunch of other different uh, domains. And those are all third parties to this. Third parties are everywhere. They're uh, images, CSS, uh, content delivery networks, fonts, maps, videos, analytics engines, uh, social media share widgets, the like button, the tweet button, uh, and obviously, of course, ads, right? So this is a map of some of the third parties that I encountered with just a quick browsing session to CNN uh, and New York Times and then Boing Boing and a couple of other sites. And we can see that all of, so each of these triangles represents a third party that was loaded on this site. Now on some of these, you can see that some of these triangles, for example, Facebook, was seen on BuzzFeed, CNN, and the New York Times. Uh, the interesting thing about that is then that third party gets to identify you with a cookie. And it gets to know that you visited all three of those sites. And it gets to know specifically what URLs you visited on those sites. Uh, this graph was made with Lightbeam, which is a uh, free software uh, extension for Firefox. Um, so all of these third parties get loaded. And it's big business. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Hundreds of, like every, practically every website you visit is going to be loading multiple third party resources. Um, there's a lot of money in this. So who is putting all of this money into this? Well, there's some companies you've heard of. Uh, Facebook, obviously, is a big player in this game. Uh, Google, also, is obviously a big player in this game. Um, but there's other companies that you haven't heard of. Scorecard Research, this is an analytics and tracking company that's present on many, many sites. Uh, and they're completely invisible. You don't know that they're there unless you're looking for these sorts of things. Axicom is a data broker that uh, takes all of this data and merges it together and sells it back to people for whatever purposes. Add this is on a lot of these. So there's some big people, there's some big companies involved in this industry, and there's a lot of them. Now, why am I focused on third party trackers, right? Why not say first party is like Amazon, right, or malware? There's a lot of people that are tracking you, right? With Amazon or with first parties, it's a little hard to define consent, right? Like when you've logged into Amazon and you're using Amazon, you might reasonably expect that they would want to know what you're looking at on their site, right? But with third parties, it's non-consensual. You don't, you might not reasonably expect that Google would want to know what you're looking at on every website you visit, right? You haven't gone to Google's site necessarily. You haven't made an, a, a deal with them, you haven't communicated with them directly. Third parties are also ubiquitous, like I showed with that uh, light beam slide. 
They're on almost every site. Uh, there was a study that said something like 90, 93% of news websites contain at least one third party resource. And most of them contain far more than that. They're hard to avoid. Um, unless you have set up and configured your ad blocker correctly, you're almost certainly seeing some third parties come through. And even if you have configured your ad blocker correctly, you're probably seeing still a lot of third parties, right? If you don't look for these things, it might, you might not even know that they're there, right? You might not understand if you're non-technical how these ads show up. They just show up and they're annoying and creepy, right? And there's a strong financial incentive too. Like I said, this is a multi-billion dollar industry. This is the business model of the web right now, for better or for worse. So this is why I'm interested in third party tracking. Um, you might say, well, but I like targeted ads, right? Targeted ads are better than, I, okay, none of you would say this. <laughs> but you can imagine somebody who might say this. The problem with targeted ads is that you have no control over how this information is stored or used, right? These aren't government bodies that we have regulations over. These are private companies and they have no obligation to anonymize this data. They have no obligation to delete this data at any point. The data can be stolen, uh, stolen. the data can be sold, the data can be misused. You can, uh, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about websites varying their prices based on third party tracking information, right? So there, there's all sorts of um, really sketchy things to be done with this data. But it's also useful for spies, right? So it turns out that the NSA really likes third party tracking and they really like piggybacking off Google cookies and other third party cookies to help identify people as they browse the web. Um, this is the slide, one of the slides that uh, some guy whose name I can't remember leaked uh, earlier this year um, about the NSA. This is a slide from the NSA's slide deck about how they use the Yahoo cookie to help track people. So this is why I'm interested in third parties, right? So again, there's people that say, well, privacy is dead. And again, none, I know none of you would say that, but you can imagine the type of person who might say this. Well, here's the type of person who might say this. <laughs> Mark Zuckerberg, for those of you who don't recognize him on site. Yeah, hissing, hissing is appropriate here. <laughs> yeah, good, good. Um, so really, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't believe in privacy. That's interesting, because he spent $30 million buying the four neighboring houses for more privacy. So clearly, this is somebody who believes in privacy for himself, but not you. And this is a common attitude amongst people who run privacy invasive services. Why should you care about privacy? Well, you might want to read things that are controversial or embarrassing. Hackers have a great history of reading things and learning things that are controversial or perhaps illegal. There's data that might be embarrassing, not on its own, but when taken in aggregate. For example, if you're looking up specific diseases on WebMD and then you start shopping for insurance claims, if there's a third party on both those sites, they might, be, they might want to adjust the estimate that they give you for an insurance uh, plan because of the diseases that you're looking at. And there's also chilling effects. Privacy is really important for freedom of speech and for freedom of thought. Uh, it's been demonstrated over and over again that when we know we're being watched, when we know that the words that we're saying are being monitored, we're less willing to say things and think things that are outside of the standards of society. Privacy lets us make mistakes. It lets us play with ideas. It lets us grow as individuals. It lets us think about our society. And it lets us discover who we are. So I think privacy is really important. But I know you all already agree with that. So let's talk about some technical stuff instead. How does online tracking work? And first I wanna take a little detour and talk about entropy because I'm gonna be saying that word a lot in a minute and I wanna define it. Entropy in information theory is 
roughly the amount of information that's contained in a message. And I'm gonna talk about it in a unit like bits. So a two bit message would have two bits of entropy. Or there's about four possible messages and any message is one in four. A cookie that's, for example, lang equals es, this is a cookie that's setting your language code, has about eight bits of entropy. There's about 255 language codes, right? So you could say that this, there's 255 possible things for this, right? Uh, a high entropy cookie, such as this one, that's about 12 characters of hex, contains 48 bits of entropy, or approximately one in 281.5 trillion possible combinations. And this is, of course, enough to uniquely identify everything on the planet. <laughs> Bless you. So, how, are, how is tracking done? Well, IP address is an obvious way to do it. There's about uh, four billion IP addresses, or about 32 bits of entropy. Um, IP address is okay for tracking, but it's not a great way to track, right? You have network address translation, you have, so a lot of people share the same IP address, or you have a lot of people, say at MIT, that are all using the same Wi-Fi access point, and so they will share the same IP address. People roam around a lot, people's IP addresses change. Um, IP addresses are one way to track people, but they're not, people are fairly well aware of how this works, and it doesn't work that well. Of course you've heard of cookies. So cookies are the most ubiquitous form of tracking, the most commonly known way to track people online. Um, and cookies can store a pretty good amount of information. Now, browsers have gotten pretty good at letting you delete cookies. Um, browsers, and, and people that use browsers have gotten pretty good at understanding how to avoid cookies, save by going into private browsing mode. So cookies have become less effective, although they are still the most common method of tracking. So companies have started using a thing called super cookies. Super cookies are a lot like cookies, but they're stored in every possible location in your browser. So we have all these really great HTML5 uh, technologies like local storage, WebSQL, Web Crypto. Unfortunately, all of these are perfectly suited for storing unique strings, much like a cookie, except they're all harder to get rid of. Um, one extremely common one was Flash local storage objects. So Flash had its own version of the cookie that could only be accessed through Flash, and there was no method in the browser to clear local storage objects. What's more, local storage objects could even be shared across browsers because they're stored in the same place on the file system. So if you got local storage objects in IceWeasel, you could then, those could then be read out in Chromium. Uh, and you could then be tracked across your browsers. Um, the solution for that, of course, is to not run Flash, which would be great. But there are so many other types of super cookies. And then there's, of course, browser fingerprinting. So fingerprinting is where you take a essentially a hash across all of the unique properties of your browser. So EFF, uh, we demonstrated fingerprinting uh, a few years ago in the Panopticlick project, which we just recently uh, revamped. It's all new, if you've checked it out before, check it out again. Um, so Panopticlick will show you exactly how fingerprintable your browser is. And it searches across things like your uh, browser version, what fonts you have installed, what browser plugins you have installed, what language you're accepting, your user agent, and so on. So this was a test of my browser that I ran. And my browser was unique amongst the 137,000 tested so far. Uh, and my fingerprint conveyed 17.07 .07 bits of identifying information. Now, the things in the fingerprint change, of course, right? and people can clear cookies, and people can clear super cookies uh, in limited cases sometimes, maybe not always. 
But when you combine these techniques, when you combine fingerprinting to regenerate cookies, to regenerate super cookies, and do all of these things, you have a really good metric with which to track people across the internet. And off the internet as well. So there's this company, Silver Push, and they have this really uh, interesting technology where, so they have the, um, what they have is they have what's called an audio beacon. And this is a, uh, a set of tones they send that is higher than what the human ear can hear. They add this to television advertisements for their clients that are working with them. And then they have an API for Android, a library for Android that people can include in their Android applications. Now, the library in your Android application is listening for this set of tones. And the advertisements on TV are generating this set of tones. This allows Silverpush to be able to from your phone, tell what TV shows you're watching, what advertisements you're seeing, whether or not you're muting them, of course, whether you like them, and so on and so forth. They're able to track the, and combine the data that they have on you from your phone with the data that's coming out of your TV. Also, Atlas by Facebook, and this isn't to pick on Facebook. There are a number of companies doing what I'm about to explain that Facebook does. But what Atlas is doing is combining the information that Facebook has about you, phone numbers, credit card data, with offline purchases. So when you go to a store and you give them your phone number or you use your credit card, they're able to, Facebook is able to get all that information in and correlate that with also what ads you see on Facebook, what ads you click on on Facebook, what things you buy offline, to get a really holistic picture of everything that you buy and do. So this is a big problem. There's a lot of tracking going on, and it's happening in a lot of ways. And can it be stopped? Well, I think it can. Um, spoiler alert. So what about incognito browsing? Well, it's, you know, when you, you can track somebody within an incognito session, of course, but when you close the incognito session, it all goes away. Um, the problem with incognito browsing all the time is that you can't stay logged into the services that you like to use. And this is a use pattern that a lot of people have. People log into a thing and then stay logged in forever and forget what their password was. And when you log them out constantly, they get mad. Um, you, you know, if you are using incognito browsing and you log into Facebook or you log into Twitter or you log into Google, then that Facebook, Google, or Twitter cookie knows who you are despite the fact that you're using incognito mode. Um, and of course, incognito mode is still vulnerable to fingerprinting and uh, possibly even certain forms of super cookies. So incognito mode probably doesn't help a whole lot here. What about Tor browser? Well, Tor browser is actually really good at stopping tracking. Uh, it's actually fantastic at stopping fingerprinting. Uh, they've done a lot of work on super cookies. They've done a lot of work just to flush out your whole identity each time you restart Tor Browser. Uh, the con of Tor Browser is that it's not a general purpose solution. I probably couldn't convince my dad to run Tor Browser, right? Um, it's still fairly difficult for the average user to use properly. And of course, if we were to get everybody on Tor Browser, we'd have to set up a lot more Tor relays so that the network could handle the load of every internet user. What about ad blockers? Well, a lot of ad blockers focus mainly on blocking advertisements uh, and not necessarily trackers. Adblock Plus doesn't block tracking by default. Ghostery doesn't block anything by default. Um, blacklists mean that they're always behind. You have to always be playing catch up to find out what the latest trackers are and get them on the list. Um, and they're not always trustworthy. Ghostry's business model is to sell information about what third parties are on what sites back to advertisers. This is what happens when you opt into their ghost rank program. Uh, other ad blockers have acceptable ads policies where they will 
go to companies and contract with them and get money and basically uh, get them to add the companies to their uh, acceptable ads policy. There's policy work, of course. The W3C is right here. Uh, and we know that they always do the right thing. Um, so the W3C was working on a standard for a long time called the Do Not Track standard. Uh, and the idea was that you would opt in to Do Not Track. You would check a check box in your browser. And this would send a header with every request saying uh, roughly that you do not wish to be tracked. Um, Unfortunately, the advertising industry got heavily involved in the uh, committee that was making the do not track standard. And the standard was not nearly as strong as it could have or should have been. Um, the other problem is that there was a very low level of adoption, right? Almost nobody ended up adopting do not track. The couple of major companies that did adopt it have since dropped it. Um, and it's not really a very good privacy preserving option. Uh, the ad industry still wasn't happy with it, so they made up their own uh, group called the Digital Advertisers Alliance. And you might recognize that logo if you've seen an ad lately. Um, this is usually in the top. So advertisers proposed that they would self-regulate. Uh, the Digital Advertising Alliance offers an opt-out. Now, what does this opt-out mean? You might think that this means an opt-out from tracking. What it's actually an opt-out from is an opt-out from seeing the ads that are tracking you, yet they can still track you. So it's kind of a worst of both worlds scenario. You don't get the benefit of targeted ads that maybe are relevant to you, but you also still get tracked. Um, it's, of course, not legally binding, and not everybody has adopted it. So at EFF, we decided to try a combination of tech and policy, because that's what we do. Um, and we wrote Privacy Badger. And this is Privacy Badger in its natural habitat, <laughs> celebrating its first birthday. So Privacy Badger is a browser plugin. It's uh, free, libre, open source software. It focuses on completely blocking trackers. Uh, and it uses an algorithm instead of a blacklist to try to determine what's tracking you specifically. Um, and we have, uh, we have a way that honest actors, people who aren't actually intending to track you, to not be blocked by Privacy Badger. So how does it work? As you browse the web, Privacy Badger tells every domain that gets loaded that you do not wish to be tracked by sending the DNT header, the, sorry, the do not track header. It looks for third parties that are being loaded as you browse the web. If a third party domain is seen on several different first party domains, uh, the actual number is three, and it appears to be tracking you, then it gets blocked. It's very simple. Uh, here's Privacy Badger running on Gawker.com, and we can see that it's seen 14 trackers so far, and it's, the red bar means that it's blocked all of those. How does it work? So um, occasionally a tracker can't be blocked without causing significant problems for the user. Um, if we block YouTube embeds, if we block Google Maps, if we block PayPal, people get upset. Um, one time we blocked YouTube comments and people got upset. I considered that a feature, not a bug. <laughs> but not everybody uses the web the way I do. So for things like YouTube, for things like Google Maps, we instead try to block them from setting cookies. We try to block them from um, doing certain forms of HTML5 super cookies and certain forms of fingerprinting. Uh, and we call this the cookie block list. So here's Privacy Badger running on Boing Boing. Uh, and you can see that um, gstatic.com and creativecommons.org were added to the cookie block list. Creativecommons.org was setting a cookie, and it looked like it was tracking you, so it was blocked. Of course, Creative Commons is not trying to track you. So we block cookies for them instead. Uh, 
users can see what is and adjust what's being blocked, what's being cookie blocked, and what's being allowed. Uh, and they can disable Privacy Badger for s entirely for certain sites if they wish. If Privacy Badger is just blocking too many things on a site that you really want to see. Uh, for, well, first of all, maybe you should consider complaining to the site. But if that won't work, then you can disable Privacy Badger for that site. Uh, and here's some examples of that, where the user has manually adjusted the uh, settings for certain domains and where you can enable, disable Privacy Badger or report a site that's broken to us. Uh, we also replace social widgets with locally hosted ones. So we replace the like button, we replace the tweet button, we replace the SoundCloud embed, all with locally hosted versions of those so that they're not automatically tracking you as soon as you visit the page. There we go. So what about third-party sites that legitimately don't wish to track their users? For that, we have the policy side. So EFF has come up with a new do not track solution uh, and a new do not track policy. It states that users sending the DNT header uh, should not be tracked in specific ways, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and we are trying to get websites to adopt this. We think that blocking domains that don't respect do not track creates an incentive to respect do not track. It's kind of the carrot and the stick approach uh, to third party tracking. So the policy specifically says that user identifiers will be discarded. Uh, logs won't be kept any longer than a specific amount of time, which I think right now is set to two weeks, but I forget exactly. Uh, data can be kept for debugging or security purposes for as long as it's needed and then discarded as soon as the debugging or security issue is resolved. Uh, data can be anonymized and aggregated into large groups of people for analytics purposes. Um, and sites that adopt the DNT policy will get automatically unblocked by Privacy Badger. So right now we have a policy up at EFF.org slash DNT policy. Uh, and we've gotten some adoption. Uh, from other companies, DuckDuckGo, AdZerk, which is an advertising company, Mixpanel, which is an analytics company, uh, Medium, which is, of course, the blogging uh, framework, Disconnect, which is another tracker blocking uh, company that makes tracker blocking software, uh, and we have more in the works. So what still needs to happen here? Well, uh, we need improvements to the speed and usability of Privacy Badger. Uh, I'm the only person who's being paid to work on Privacy Badger. We have, of course, uh, some really great uh, volunteer contributors because it's open source, um, but we can always use more. Uh, we need to detect more types of super cookies. Like I said, there's a lot of types of super cookies out there, uh, and we need to catch up with all of them. And of course, we need to detect more types of fingerprinting as well. Um, and we want more people to adopt the do not track policy. So, how can you help? Um, you can help by using Privacy Badger, of course. You can help by submitting a bug report or a pull request. We're up on GitHub, uh, github.com slash EFF org. Um, you can help by adopting our DNT policy if you run a website. Um, and of course you can donate to EFF. We're a membership driven organization, much like the FSF. So Privacy Badger is pretty great. I've been working on it for two years and I really like it, but that's because it's my baby. Of course I like it. But I can't do as much as I would like from a plugin. We still need better tools in the web browsers. We need built in tracking protection. Uh, and this is already happening in some cases. Firefox uh, now has a built-in tracking protection mode in private browsing mode. Um, but we need this in other browsers as well. Um, double keyed cookies would be really nice. Uh, Tor browser supports this. The idea is that when a third party sets a cookie, say double click sets a, sets a cookie, uh, the cookie is not only keyed to double click, but it's also keyed to the first party that the cookie was set on. So when you visit New York Times and double click sets a cookie, that cookie, that cookie could only be read 
by double click on NewYorkTimes.com. Uh, this would be a great thing to have in browsers. It would be a huge privacy win. Uh, and of course, the same thing for super cookies. Um, unfortunately, right now, Tor Browser is the only uh, browser that does anything remotely like this. We need browsers that are hardened against fingerprinting. Um, again, Tor Browser is great at this, but none of the other browsers are. Browser fingerprinting is still a huge problem, and there's not much I can do about it from plugin land. And we need better controls for blocking or clearing super cookies. Um, right now, there are very few ways to clear super cookies from your browser. Uh, and it seems like browser makers aren't even interested in doing this. We also need new business models for the web. Because of course, browsers can't do this on their own. If we block all advertising, then maybe the web ecosystem, the web economy dies, right? We need new business models. Uh, and maybe things like memberships, maybe things like donations, right? The Guardian has a really good example of this. When they see that you're running with an ad blocker, instead of blocking you from reading The Guardian, they pop up a window that says, hey, we see you're running an ad blocker. That's great, but would you consider donating a couple of bucks to us since we won't be making money off the ads? I think this is a great model. Um, and of course, things like crowdfunding have been shown to work really well. Micropayments are a really interesting thing. Um, and of course, non-intrusive advertising would be just fine with me, right? Is advertising the best way to, that we can fund the web? It's really hard to say. It's certainly the way that we're funding the web currently. But if we're gonna stick with advertising as the business model of the web, then it must stop violating users' consent, privacy without their consent. Now go install Privacy Badger. Thank you very much. So I think I have about a little, little more than 10 minutes for, question, 10 minutes for questions. Uh, if you do have a question, please come down to the microphone. Um, yeah. Is there any way that we can fingerprint the fingerprinters? Is there anything you could gather in the way of what goes on in our machines collectively to inform you how to help us defend against this? I'm sorry, I, I'm not sure I totally understand the question. Can you repeat it? Well, you're um, using Privacy Badger mm -hmm. to block uh, certain things that the surveyors want to do. They're putting things on our machines that are a, a little hard to detect. Mm -hmm. Could you gather information about the way they're sort of polluting our machines if you could look at thousands of machines at a time? Mm, yeah, okay. So, yeah, we could. You could certainly... Um, you know, aggregate the data from the, you know, the tracking cookies and tracking super cookies from a lot of people's machines and get a better insight into how this is all working. Uh, of course, the problem with that is there's a big potential privacy risk there, right? If you have data from thousands of people's machines, then you have data from thousands of people's machines, and that's very interesting uh, to a certain set of people, right? So will I do that? No, because I don't want to hold that data. I don't want the responsibility. I know, it's a terrible situation. I feel you. <laughs> I understand. And you didn't even make it. You just got born into this. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, so it's, I don't want to be responsible for holding that data, and I don't trust anybody that would want to be responsible for holding that data. So that's... Well, thank you. Um, you don't know me that well. But you have EFF stamp on you. Right, so I must be trustworthy. Exactly. Go ahead. I thought that uh, when cookies were first um, allowed on web browsers and stuff, that there were supposed to be regulations about how they would be used, how advertisers would stay with their cookies, not look at other people's cookies. Yeah. Not have third party cookies. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So, and, and I'm sorry, my question was just about what's a super cookie. If you, I was late of a couple minutes, so if you already oh, yeah, addressed that. But. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, um, 
there are regulations and there are standards built into cookies, right? A cookie can only be read by the domain that set it. And this is true. When DoubleClick sets a cookie, only DoubleClick can read that cookie, right? Or when Facebook sets a cookie and so on. The problem is a thing called the referrer header. So, and a thing called iframes. So when my site, Cooper's tracking site, or double click, uh, is embedded on say slash dot, right? It, because of the referrer header, gets to see that it's being loaded from slash dot. And in fact, it gets to see the specific URL on slash dot that's loading it. Then it gets to look at its cookie and it gets to know who you are. So then when you visit another, it gets to look at, double clicks, gets to look at its own cookie, that is to say. So then when you visit another site, when you visit New York Times, double click sees its own cookie again, and it knows who you are, and it knows that you visited slash dot, and now it gets to see that you visited New York Times. So even though there is what's called same origin policy, where double click only gets to see its own cookies, this is how they get to know what sites you've visited and you know, who you are because of that high entropy string that's in the cookie that uniquely identifies you. Uh, really quickly, he had asked what a super cookie is. A super cookie is a lot like a cookie, except it's, uh, it, it's stored in other unique places in your browser. There are many different types of super cookies, uh, and they also store a unique string. Hi, thank you first for uh, doing Privacy Badger. I've been using it, and I feel better. <laughs> Great. Um, Here, the second you. is um, a question about some points you made within your talk as to the effectiveness of other uh, plugins that uh, I thought were able to address things like the super cookies, and I'm thinking of uh, better privacy, I believe is the one that, yeah. am, am I mistaken in feeling safe with that? Uh, that's a good question. I haven't looked into better privacy, yeah. um, but I have seen it recommended by people that I trust. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm hoping that's taking care of the super yeah, so that might somewhat. be Yeah, so that might be doing a good job of taking care of yeah. some super cookies, but I, like I said, I can't personally recommend it because and I haven't looked into it or okay. used it or anything. But and, and I mean, it's, I, it probably doesn't hurt to run it, it in addition to Privacy Badger or whatever else you would like to run. But it may not be covering the whole uh, range of potential super cookies and yeah. techniques that could be used yeah. in similar vein. Um, in, in uh, terms of browser fingerprinting, mm -hmm. there's also another add-on that I use, and the name is escaping me at this time, but it allows me to, uh, you know, if I'm running a particular distro of Linux, um, up in the top-hand corner, similar right next to my uh, privacy badger, um, I can see, oh, what am I looking like to those entities out there that are looking at me? Uh -huh. And I can switch, and I can say, oh, today um, I'm, running Microsoft, or I'm running sure. Safari browser, or I'm, you know, um, a cell phone, or, um, yeah. so it does somewhat, I'm, I'm trusting these um, browser add-ons, and you're telling within the body of your talk that no, the, those aren't there. So I'm, I think what I was more getting at is none of these can offer perfect defense, right? And of course nothing can. A browser could offer far better defense than we can, than any of us can ever do in a plugin, right? And you can certainly do things in a plugin. Um, I think it'd be interesting to take the fingerprinting plugin, for example, and go to Panopticlick with it and see whether Panopticlick thinks it can fingerprint your browser, even with the fingerprinting plugin. Yeah, I, I think I've done that, and it gives you, I think, an entropy measure. Is yeah. that uh -huh. what it's called? Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Thank you. So yeah, I mean, it, it's all sort of a form of like what we talk about defense in depth, right? Like none of these plugins are perfect on their own. We can't stop all of the types of tracking. The only thing that really stops all of the types of tracking is blocking the domain entirely, right? But of course we can't always block all of the domains. Um, but I think that if you, you know, run all of these plugins, that's great. You know, the more protection, the better, right? So. Uh, great work. I've, I've been using Privacy Badger since the beginning. I Thank think you. it's awesome. But I have a more of a philosophical question about yes. ads and, and privacy. I mean, obviously, privacy tracking is probably the most important thing. But if somebody's going to be installing Privacy Badger, they're probably going to also be installing or have the ability to install an ad blocker as well. Uh -huh. And I, I think you, towards the end, you sort of hinted this at are ads going to be able to pay for the web? You know, will right. the future of web not have ads? Would you really be okay if every ad you ever saw on the internet was there, but it didn't have any tracking associated with it at all? 
is that is that something we'd be okay with? Or if you could just right click on that and say hide ad and it would be gone forever, is that something that we should empower users to do? Yeah. So that's a really good question. Um, I think that as long as we're going to have to live in capitalism, <laughs> websites and the people that are operating websites need to be able to pay their rent, right? Ideally, I would like for that to be through a method other than advertising because I personally find advertising distasteful. But it seems like for now, we've sort of landed on um, advertising as the method of the economy, as the economy of the web, right? And I think we should push to change that. I really do. Um, and there's a lot of other problems with advertising as well, besides third party tracking, right? There's malvertising, there's the continued use of Flash and running job, untrusted JavaScript in your browser, right? So like all of that needs to change, right? We need, like if we went back to simple static text ads that weren't obnoxious, didn't serve malware, didn't run JavaScript and didn't track me, yes, I would be fine with having ads everywhere if that's the economy that we decided to have, right? I would, but I, yeah, I would like to see the web economy pushed towards other models like donations, micropayments, things like that. Um, and I guess just so like tiny yeah. add-on, is that something that you think the EFF should like, or some other group should like actually advocate for through policy or whatever? Or maybe that's just too much too utopian of a uh, concept to just to forget about. Too utopian for the Free Software Foundation. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think that, like, I, so we're, we're advocating for at least one part of that with our do not track work, right? We're advocating strongly for the do not track thing. Um, and of course, along with that comes, like, you know, malvertising, right? And uh, other, other things like that, right? Uh, Ad Block Bus is advocating strongly for ads that aren't totally obnoxious, mm -hmm. right? Um, which I think is the least of those problems, but that they're, you know, doing something, right? It is one of these problems, right? So. Yeah, I think that our organizations should absolutely be advocating for these sorts of for these sorts of changes, and I think we should be advocating uh, for different business models on the web. Yeah. And who decides the level of obnoxiousness? Uh, in AdBlock Plus's case, AdBlock Plus decides, and they get paid to decide, which is a little. Oh, okay. How does? Oh, that's right. No, you have a committee now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. I, I would love to talk to you later. Sure. Now that I've just <laughs> pissed you off. <laughs> Hopefully not. Uh, great. Uh, yeah, back there. Yeah, of course. No, he, he can't. It's fine, he can't. So the, the question was, um, what would I think about a site that ranks the effectiveness of various blockers, uh, how good they are, and what sort of features they provide? I think that would be great. Um, and of course, I would want to rank Privacy Badger number one. So it probably shouldn't be me that runs this site. But if somebody else wanted to start such a site that didn't have a vested interest in one of the ad blockers and could rank them objectively, uh, I think that would be fantastic. Ghostery has such a site, but of course they also have a vested interest. So maybe somebody else besides me and besides Ghostery uh, should start a site like this. I think that would be excellent. Um, I think I have two minutes left, so I probably have time for one more question. And here it is. I'm not on Facebook. Good for you. My understanding is that uh, Facebook tracks me anyway. Is that, uh, is that so? And uh, how do you feel about that? Um, that's a good question. And I think that the answer is yes. I think that they were maybe prevented from doing so in Europe by European law but I don't think that that was the case in America. Although I'm not sure about this, so don't quote me on it. Um, if they are doing that, uh, I, I mean, obviously that's terrible, right? Uh, they have no 
I mean, I don't think that anybody has any business tracking you. Uh, and, but of course, Facebook can make the case that if you're logged in, they should be able to track you around Facebook. Um, but if you're not even logged into Facebook, if you're not using Facebook, and they're still tracking you anyway, right? You, that's obviously a violation of your consent, which is just as bad as any of these other trackers, right? So yeah, no, I'm completely against that. Um, yeah. How could we find out? How could we find out? Um, well, you could see how often the cookie that Facebook will set in your browser changes. If it changes fairly frequently, then they're probably not tracking you, right? But if it is a long-lived cookie that's high entropy, right, that it has like a pretty unique string in it that doesn't change for years, then they're almost certainly tracking you, or at least they have the ability to. All right, so I think that's it. Uh, thanks again. Thank you.